Thanks a lot for giving us the opportunity here uh, to raise attention, to raise awareness about the topic of energy efficiency. Uh, my name is Julian Genetienik, uh, and I'm uh, president for the business unit in charge of plate exchanges at Alfa Laval and uh, vice president of the energy division. Alfa Laval is a company headquartered in Sweden and is the global uh, leading supplier of a highly efficient solution uh, for heat transfer, separation and flow. And uh, we have made our own commitment to carbon neutrality by signing the 1.5 degree business playbook. And the announcement this morning of the partnership with SSAB uh, in order to produce the first plate interchanger made of carbon free steel is a major step on that journey. Uh, all of our equipment are predominantly made of steel, so this is a major step. But the journey ahead uh, is still long and there's many, many more steps to be made uh, towards a full carbon neutrality by 2030. Similarly to, to us, many companies, many governments are making commitments towards carbon neutrality. But then comes the question, where to start? Is it about installing more windmills, installing more solar panels, uh, finding new renewable source of uh, fuels and chemicals? Uh, is it about influencing the energy mix, addressing the hard to abate sector? Uh, well, it's probably all of the above. But usually, we are forgetting about one essential solution, and it is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency, as Jonas say, is, is the cheapest and the most renewable source of energy. It's the energy that everyone possesses. Uh, is there any more sustainable source of energy than the one we don't have to produce in the first place? And it will and needs to have a strong contribution in our race to net zero. As we can see here on the graph uh, um, made by the IEA in their scenario to reach net zero, uh, the contribution of energy efficiency from the current trends uh, all the way to 2040 needs to contribute with 40% reduction of the CO2. So this is a strong contributor and what we cannot see on this graph is that by 2030 the contribution of energy efficiency uh, will be up to 50% CO2 reduction. The other good thing about energy efficiency is that the solutions are already available. They just need to be implemented. Alfa Laval has, for example, some of those solutions. Uh, one of them, heat exchangers, is particularly uh, important in this part of uh, driving energy efficiency. Uh, you don't usually find any, uh, heat exchangers, uh, or don't, you don't really see them, but normally they are within, we tend to say, one mile or one kilometer uh, around you, you might find uh, heat exchangers. They are usually hidden in a building to help heat or cool a building. They are in the process to produce food, chemicals, uh, and, and other fuels. Uh, and they do that when applying the, the right technology, they do that with a superior uh, energy efficiency. Uh, I have the chance here to have on stage one of such plate heat exchangers, and we deliver many every year. And all of the heat exchangers we deliver in a year contributes to 50 gigawatt of energy saving uh, every year. If you add the energy saving that is coming from the maintenance of the install base of existing plated exchanger, uh, you add another 50 gigawatt of energy saving. All in all, that's 100 gigawatt of energy savings that we deliver uh, every year to the world. That corresponds almost to as much as the 90 gigawatt of new windmills that are being installed every year on the planet. Um, for those who uh, are used to these mass, and for those who are not used to these mass, 100 gigawatt correspond to 50 million tons of CO2. That's twice the size of uh, the consumption or the production and emission of a city like Paris. At COP26, we have joined uh, ABB in launching the energy efficiency movement, uh, a movement aiming at raising the attention and awareness about energy efficiency as a key element of the race to net zero. Um, and in our preparation to COP27, uh, we are welcoming many other members coming from academia, uh, government, institution, companies, uh, competitors or not, to join the movement and increase the awareness and uh, the attention on energy efficiency 
as a key enabler uh, to, in our race to net zero, where solutions are already available, they are just need to be scaled up. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so we're here to talk about energy efficiency, and thank you very much for all your keynotes and covered many, many topics. But, um, okay, so I've been was with the UN for 17 years at the UNEP and also with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. I was also a journalist on the Times newspaper in the 1990s covering the environment and technology. And this thing about energy efficiency, even these, these points you're making, which is, a, you know, a kilowatt of energy saved is, 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 is the best possible thing, you know, that you could possibly think of. They've been with us for years, right? These, these, everyone's known intuitive, intuitively and practically that this was absolutely a killer thing that we should do. We should deal with energy efficiency. And yet, and you had the numbers before, by the way, and there's some IRENA numbers that say by 2030, uh, I think you have to, about 25% of the contribution will come from energy efficiency to halve emissions. Lots of numbers around on the benefit, but why is it never taken off? Why, why is it still the Cinderella, if I can call it that, Cinder you know Cinderella from the... <laughs> Do you have any children? Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, why is it still the Cinderella topic? Um, yeah, maybe I can pick yeah. up on that. Okay. And I will come back a little bit to what I was talking about in my keynote speak. Yeah. Uh, we have known about it for a very long time, as you know, as you said. And from my perspective, from ABB's perspective, we have now with all the new digital solutions, we have now the possibility to do, is do, do these assessments and, and, and energy analysis mm -hmm. from a holistic perspective in a very easy and cost-efficient way. And that's the new thing. Before you had to you know, go out there in a complex industry environment, dangerous maybe, mm -hmm. uh, to assess motors or other equipment. Mm -hmm. Now it's possible to do it remotely. So that is kind of a, a new take on this one. Mm -hmm. So that's the connection with digitalization yeah, as well, yeah. Exactly. And Sorry. I would like yeah. to compliment because I think what gets measured gets done. And I think that's, if you look mm -hmm. at transportation and buildings, there has been some progress there and it was easier to measure, either to identify, you could have targeted incentive, targeted mm -hmm. certification process. In the industry area, that's the measurement data and the data were the point missing to have government, uh, institutions, companies engaging on this roadmap. Digitalization will be a key enabler to drive energy efficiency, to support incentive, to support governmental programs and company-wide initiative to drive energy efficiency to a larger extent mm -hmm. than it has been. And industry is roughly, or the energy efficiency gains in the industry is estimated to be half of the solution. Yeah. Buildings and transportation is partly already addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need, we need solution from the digital world. Absolutely, and, and I think part of the, the problem has been actually uh, these, some data has been there, uh, mm -hmm. let's face it, to get that data to a, to a place where you can analyze that and create insights, mm -hmm. these kind of insights in regards to like where are the, the energy uh, pain, pain points, so to say, that was not as, as easy to do for, for, for many industries. And I think uh, that has kind of evolved with the with new digital um, technologies, even like, you know, retrofitting all systems to get that data to even like the, the technology in regards to like your, your biggest computing computing at the factory for instance to get to get that type of a compute mm -hmm. at the factory so that you can get those type of insights already inside a factory let's say mm -hmm. so that that has taken time to to actually mature that has taken time to actually open up to mm -hmm. say like yeah let's look at uh, there is some data, but some new data we need. Mm -hmm. We need some new IoT systems and so on. Uh, digital twins are still, uh, uh, I, in my view, of visual thinking. <laughs> We're still mm -hmm. not there yet and so on. Mm -hmm. so, so, but it's, it's happening. And, and there is a tremendous, uh, tremendous gains to be gained, uh, even from uh, just facility uh, optimization, mm -hmm. uh, 15 to 20 percent, mm -hmm. for instance, energy efficiency. That is, that is good enough to, for instance, to implement a solution like mm -hmm. that, for instance. 
So are there any other obstacles in this? I mean, I, 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 I'm looking at the thing that looks like it's come from a Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> sorry for all these British TV references. This Doctor Who thing over here from Alpha Laval, right? That apparently, there are all these sitting in hidden places, right, that nobody sees them, but they're doing all this work. Is part of the problem that um, it's not the technology or the digitalization, but these must be in cities all over the world, right? How do we... How do the cities get the finance? How do they... Is it the cities? Or, or is it the training of the, the experts? The, I mean, you think about Germany, where they've been trying to get heat pumps in, and, and they haven't got that many in because nobody knows how to install them, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Is it a training thing? Is it a finance for city thing? Are there other blockages to the energy efficiency massive step up that's clearly possible and would be very gratefully received by, you know, planet Earth and the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, any well, other factors? I, I think you touch upon the word innovation. The innovation is not so much in the technology, even though we all innovate on you know, improving our product even further. Mm -hmm. But probably one of the key innovations should come from business model, innovative into business model, because what you talk about uh, cities and what a city would do, but a city would possibly reuse the heat or the excess heat that is generated by an industry or a data center, mm -hmm. which require then a sector coupling between a private and a public sector. Mm -hmm. And this type of business uh, model innovation is key and needs to be encouraged uh, mm -hmm. in order to stimulate, for example, the reuse of waste heat from an industry into mm -hmm. a district heating or district cooling network. Mm -hmm. Education is also a key element and a key enabler. If we consider that energy efficiency is a good way to decouple social and economic growth, and at least don't, sacri don't sacrifice social and economic growth mm -hmm. uh, while don't emit more, uh, while we don't emit more, uh, then education and training around the importance mm -hmm. of energy efficiency is going to be key in our countries, in developing countries even more, as they get the opportunity to get their industrial network right in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to come to that because I think this... In the past, the debate on energy efficiency was always like it's a developed country thing because they have all the emissions, so if you can make those more efficient. But for the, the poorer countries, it's not important, right? Because they don't have any emissions, right? To be efficient about. Um, but that's kind of changing, isn't it? Because we have our Chinas and our Indias, we have our Brazils and our Mexicos, and, you know, indeed, we have our least developed countries. That's maybe a different thing altogether, right? But... Can we take what we're, we're developing here in, in wonderful Sweden, Northern Europe, blah, 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 and export these two countries in ways that would help them? And again, where does the finance come? That's yeah. the other big question, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the short answer to that question is, yes, of course, let's take this technology. It's not a rock and science kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So all the developing countries have the possibility to do right from the beginning, as you just said. Mm -hmm. and I would also like to touch upon the business model thing, because fin the financial part of it could, might potentially be an issue. So there I think also from the industry we need to look into different kind of business models mm -hmm. to really allowing all countries to join in on this. Mm. It could be, for example, leasing agreements or, or, or other type of business models that we are not using to that mm -hmm. biggest extent today. Mm. Mm. Okay, I, I, th I, I think there's two things that I... Um, the first one, from a, from a business perspective, I, th I think one, one thing that is really important is, is the, the, the culture in regards to how... In, within the industry and the company, the, in regards to how we talk uh, on energy efficiency. Uh, understanding that that is actually where we can take action right now. Mm -hmm. And that's what we actually need. We need action, and that is... Uh, the easy or the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, the, other, the other part, w w if we compare countries, I used to work at ABB as well uh, back, back in the day. It's and so cosy here in Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you probably worked at ABB as well, didn't she? She probably worked at Alpha Laval. But, Don't uh, say Volvo cars as well. Yeah, 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 it's all yeah, okay. uh, but, but one point there, like I, we used to get these like, uh, requirements on how to build these huge power uh, HVDC transformers, and whenever they came from, uh, from uh, developing countries, underdeveloped countries, mm -hmm. the, the, the losses that they tolerated were a lot higher than they were, for instance, uh, if, if that specification came from Germany. Mm -hmm. so, so there is that part of... Uh, 
uh, raising that awareness, that education, uh, and saying that if you, even in the power transmission, we could save a lot by actually just changing the specification and asking mm. for a better designed product. Yeah, sorry. I could Julian. add one more thing. I said in my keynote that energy efficiency is the energy source that every country or everyone possesses. Mm -hmm. And there was a statistic in the, um, made by the IEA that 1 million euro invested in energy efficiency is creating up to 6 to 15 full-time jobs yeah. in the country yeah. where you make this investment. So it's a very mm. local business mm. as well. So it's a fantastic opportunity for mm -hmm. governments of developed and in countries in development to, uh, to foster energy efficiency measures. Yeah. I'm glad you men mentioned jobs because it hasn't really come up in any of the shows so far and I hope it will come up later in the day because uh, we need to connect uh, these kinds of innovations and kind of changes with what does it mean for people's jobs on the ground because obviously you know, we want the world to get off fossil fuels, for example, and, and, and there's obviously some concern in some countries. South Africa, for example, at the climate COP in Glasgow, needed some reassurances from the so-called donor countries that, that, that there would be some just transition within this getting out of coal, for example. So I'm glad you mentioned jobs. But I, I wanted to come back a little bit on the, on the, the issue of the, the developing countries, because it strikes me that in Europe and North America and other places, we're innovating these things, and our governments are, you know, pleased we're innovating them, I think, in, in, to a large extent, and we're contributing to emission reductions in our northern countries. But the big prize is in the developing countries, right? Because that's where the emissions are going to surge off the Richter scale unless we help. So do you think institutions like Business Sweden and export credits and all these other things come into play in this very important area that we need political cooperation between nations, which sorely sometimes is a bit of a headache. Uh, and because we're talking about the, the 1972 conference, which was trying to get international environmental policy moving for the first time ever. Um, do you think that there is an opportunity for the governments of, say, the Nordic regions to, to, to make it more favorable to bring these developments to the developing countries? To I work on I certainly those. think so. And yeah. as you were, implying with new business model uh, should come also a new financing model. Yeah. And uh, there's an opportunity to foster and develop more programs. Business Sweden can, can be one vector of that and other export credit uh, agency can be a vector for that in order to secure the implementation of energy efficiency first principle mm -hmm. in developing countries as they are developing their industrial mm -hmm. network, their cities, their transportation network. So right. certainly so. Yeah. Yeah. I agree as well. I think it, this is not a, a one-man show or not the industry's own show, so to say. We need to, to really, truly collaborate. Yeah. I mean, Business Sweden for sure and other organizations. And I, I think it's a great opportunity for us in the northern, northern part of Europe to really mm. help and support, but also, as you were mentioning, local trainings, so to say, to write you know, the right specifications from the beginning mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to make the necessary high demands uh, locally in the countries. Well, you, you mentioned buildings before, because I always find that a fascinating area, because there is something that was born in Paris in 2015 at the, uh, at the, at the Paris Climate Conference, which was actually UNEP, the UN Environment Programme, as the Secretariat, which is the Alliance for Buildings and Construction. And whenever they bring their assessments out, uh, it's always stubbornly that buildings are about 38% of global CO2 emissions. And you see, you know, lighting coming in, LEDs and all that, you see all this coming in. But stubbornly, <laughs> it remains like 38%. This efficiency area has got to be a, a big gain there, but I think it gets back to this other question, which is who makes the decision in these buildings to have these kinds of better heat exchangers, digitalization, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to motors. Um, who makes that choice? Is it the government, the city, the landlord, whoever owns the building, the homeowner? Are there incentives for it? And if it's a, a big building, you know, who's deciding on that? Because there are people that own the whole estates of buildings, don't they? Shopping malls and things like that. This is a complex structure. Maybe it's not what you're specifically working on, but I think it's important to reflect that 
I, I, can, I can comment on yeah. that. <laughs> it's a complex world out there to I, get I, these I, things I can out. comment on that a little yeah. bit. I think most of that comes actually from the way we utilise the buildings. Like, so the utilisation is very, very low. Mm. And uh, if you look at... Uh, if, if I've, I've worked with uh, smart buildings for like seven, seven years ago and everybody was talking about how you could save up to 40%, but that didn't really happen. Mm -hmm. I think what happened during COVID, there is now also something, there is a movement that is happening in regards to how we utilize, for instance, our offices. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, these business, new business models where you actually uh, can uh, be at a, at a hotel of office no, near the neighborhood, so you don't even mm -hmm. have to travel. Mm -hmm. so, so there is things like that that is going to change that game a little bit. But then uh, there is a lot, of, a lot of commercial buildings that are unutilized or utilized very, very low. Mm. So that's, that's a big, big issue. Mm -hmm. I could bring two reflection. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, but uh, if, I, if I take this building here in Stockholm, mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, the heat exchanger that has been designed to cool and heat this building has been designed for extreme condition when it's 45 degrees C in Stockholm, mm -hmm. which is not every day, mm -hmm. or when it's minus 25. Yeah. But very seldom it actually operates at the optimum conditions. And here, digitalization and smart conduction of a heat exchanger, for example, of all, any other products, e is going to be key. Yeah. Uh, we consider that half of our heat exchangers are not operating anywhere close to, the, uh, to their um, maximum and ideal uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. And that represents, in total, for all heat exchangers, up to one gigaton of CO2 uh, that is consumed or emitted Mm -hmm. uh, because of poorly performing heat exchangers. Right. So there is a huge opportunity to optimize the, the way we run and utilize existing building. Mm -hmm. Then if you move in the, in the developing world, uh, one of the uh, previous speakers on stage was talking about what happens between the two in the tropical areas where most of the population mm -hmm. is located. Mm -hmm. And the need for cooling here mm -hmm. will be really critical in buildings. And there was an assessment that if every single people that is living in this area will put a small AC, it will require the electricity production of Europe, yeah. Japan and US alone yeah. to be added. Yeah. There are smarter solutions to do that using district cooling network, uh, reusing uh, cold water from the river uh, that we do implement in some part of the world and that we have to get right as we plan and develop new cities um, in yeah. this part of the world as well. Yeah. So yeah. I would imagine that this is probably the developing part and the poor utilization is probably tainted all the other efforts that are made in order to improve that. So yes. we are stuck yes. on that 38% yes. that you mentioned, yes. Nick. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right on the air conditioning. It, it is a potential disaster in the making if they don't get it right and also don't use the right chemicals in the air conditioners, not the old ones, which, uh, you know... I mean, HFCs have gone, but there's other nasty ones uh, knocking around the system these days. Um, let me ask you one other thing. I mean, we've got Egypt coming uh, in, uh, in uh, November for this Climate COP27. You mentioned some new alliance that... Mm. Who's in this alliance? Who are they? And, and have you got any targets on Egypt? I guess you're referring to the energy efficiency movement yeah. that I was talking about. Alpha yeah. Laval is one partner uh, okay. in this, and we have many, is many Microsoft more. Is Microsoft not a partner? Not yet, but oh, maybe soon. Oh, that's so sad, yes. isn't it? Why don't you join soon. them? Right? <laughs> yes. You'll be very right welcome. Here. <laughs> right here, yes. <laughs> we don't want to be left uh, out. And we're many more. But, I mean, to really change, so to say, the political atmosphere uh, yeah. in, in a meeting like that, a forum like that, we need to be many more in a, in a movement like this. Mm -hmm. We need to, you know, as I said before, expand the political focus to also include the energy efficiency topic. Mm -hmm. Because it, it is, you know, progressing on the agenda, but it's not, as far as I think at least, mm -hmm to, to uh, as high as it needs to be. So there I think, you know, raising awareness, talking about this, be here talking about it with all stakeholders. This is the way we are going to change it. We need to raise our common awareness about this. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of your challenges is that when you come to a UN climate conference, it's always different groups of nations who are like, what's in it for us, right? Yeah. And obviously the rich countries can see it quite clearly, but I think some developing countries still see it as you're just trying to make, say, fossil fuels more efficient. But 
as the renewable energy sector grows, you've got to make the renewable energy sector more efficient as well, haven't you? Yes. Because we don't want to waste all that wind power and solar power, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> so it doesn't go away. It's not like it's about reducing fossil fuel emissions. Yes, it is. But it's also about reducing the losses that you might get from inefficiencies in the renewable energy sector too. So it's Absolutely. actually two areas. Yeah. No, yeah. but it's, it's um, for me, true success at COP27 will be that all countries will adopt an, an energy, fir energy efficiency first principle. Yeah. Yet we should not oppose the renewable electricity and renewable chemicals and fuels that are needed because in order to reach net zero, we will need that. Yeah. It needs to be a balanced view on the two set of solutions, yeah. energy efficiency, and renewable uh, source of energy has yeah. to be co-developed at the same time. Yeah. The timeline might be different. One is ready for scale-up, mm -hmm. one needs to be developed and mature in terms of technology. S but both will require investment, capital allocation, uh, in order to succeed in both yeah. and reach the target of net zero by 2050. Okay. Uh I can take okay. half a second, because uh, there's a little clock there telling me to shut up. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, half a second and, yeah. and, and say that one, one important thing, I guess, is, is to, to use this narrative that has existed if in the ICT community on how you, you scale things mm -hmm. and which kind of partners you work to create these new business models. A lot of times is actually, even for underdeveloped countries, is what kind of value do you deliver with a solution? So if you cannot add the value by yeah. adding Adding, you know, dig digitalization as part of the part of the solution, yeah. uh, I think it will it will it will scale in, in those countries as well. Yeah. Good, everybody. I think we're going to have to close it there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I love energy efficiency. I think it's a really fascinating topic. The only reason I was being a bit hard about it was it's been such a strong topic for so many years, and I really hope it can take off much more, especially with this new alliance initiative or whatever energy you want to call efficiency it. movement. Energy efficiency movement. Let's yes. remember that one. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care.